Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 284 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Every year, the United States holds elections. Often these elections are for city, town, and state offices. However, every two years, the United States holds federal elections, where the American people elect those who will represent and serve them in their national government. How did elections in the United States develop? And who is American democracy for? And who gets to participate in that democracy by voting? As 2020 is a federal election year, my colleagues Joseph Edelman, Holly White, and I have found ourselves wondering about these questions. So we decided to create a podcast series to investigate answers to them. Over the next four episodes, Holly, Joe, and I are going to investigate how the practice of holding elections and voting for representatives has developed and changed over time. Specifically, we're going to explore the early American origins of elections and voting practices in the United States. In our first episode, Holly will take us back to colonial America so that we can investigate how elections and democracy took hold in the British North American context. In our second episode, we'll explore the origins and development of federal elections and who could participate in those elections. Our third episode will allow us to explore different aspects of Native American sovereignty and whether the new United States left any space for Native American peoples to participate in state and federal elections. And in our fourth episode, Joseph Edelman will conclude with an investigation of presidential elections and the development of the Electoral College. But first, did you know that we've prepared a list of companion readings, exhibits, and digital projects to go along with this series? All of the guest scholars that you'll hear throughout this series were kind enough to recommend resources that you can use to further explore the history of early American elections beyond just these episodes. You'll find all of these resources, along with all of the sources that Holly, Joe, and I consulted to create this series, in the Omohundro Institute's brand new OI Reader. Now a web-based app, the OI Reader offers digital editions of the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943, plus an open WMQ section, where we can offer you additional digital resources for some of our podcast episodes and our series. To access the companion resources for this series about elections, which include two William & Mary Quarterly articles, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash oireader. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash oireader. Okay, before we meet Holly, allow me to introduce you to her. Holly White is the Assistant Editor of Digital Projects and OI Publications at the Omohundro Institute. She's also one of our Associate Producers on Ben Franklin's World. Holly is a historian of the early Republic period, who specializes in the history of gender, family, and childhood and youth. Holly is working on a book with the University of Virginia Press, which is tentatively titled Negotiating American Youth, Age, Law, and Culture in the Early 19th Century. And with that, here's Holly to take it away. The British North American colonies came to form some of the most democratic governments in the world. But that does not mean that all early Americans were treated equally and allowed to participate in representative government. Race, class, status, and gender impeded many from casting a vote well into the 20th century. So who could vote in early America? Who could participate in representative government? Before we can fully grasp the significance of who could vote in the 17th and 18th centuries and why, we first need to understand the origins of Anglo-American representative government. We need to know who democracy was originally meant for and how those who lived in colonial British America understood democracy. To answer the question of who democracy was for, we'll speak with James Kloppenberg, the Charles Warren Professor of History at Harvard. He's the author of numerous books, including his most recent, Toward Democracy, the Struggle for Self-Rule in European and American Thought. Jim, we know that the British North American colonies came to form some of the most democratic governments in the world. 
Would you tell us where they got their democratic ideas and what government looked like in 17th century England? Was it democratic? Well, the first question I think we have to address is what do we mean by democracy? Because the term has a very different meaning in the 21st century than it had in the 17th or 18th centuries. The term itself enters European languages when Dominican friars in the 13th century first translate Aristotle. And they have to invent words for it because the idea of self-government, as the Greeks understood it, didn't really exist. The Romans used the term res publica, from which we get our word republic. And the Greeks, of course, used demos and kratos for popular rule. So the two terms both designate government by the people. And the difference is simply that democracy descends from the Greek and republic descends from Latin. Both terms in the 17th and 18th century meant self-rule in the sense of popular sovereignty, in the sense that power came from the people. And that was a radical idea because in most European countries and certainly in Britain, Sovereignty was thought to reside in the king or perhaps in the king in parliament, as the term was used in England. The assumption was that the people were not the source of authority, but it was instead the monarchy that ruled. And that way of thinking descends from the revulsion that Europeans felt from the 16th century wars of religion and the murderous rampages of competing religious groups convinced so many Europeans that they needed absolute authority, that the theory of royal absolutism emerged. And so when in the 17th century, some English colonists began taking steps toward governing themselves, this was really something quite unknown in European experience. The origins of Parliament are lost in the mists of time. There was something resembling Parliament around the 10th century. There were assemblies of notables who were called by the king and gathered with him for various reasons, for him to dispense patronage and demonstrate his majesty for them together, the king and the notables, to draw up legislation and for them to do the work of a judiciary to decide on the resolution of disputes. All of these notables, as far as we can tell, thought of themselves as speaking for the nation, not speaking for particular places. After the Norman Conquest in 1066, the king established a new nobility, which displaced the old nobility. But that new nobility also owed taxes to the king and owed fealty to the king. That remained pretty much the case until Magna Carta, until 1215 when a general assembly of the nobles was convened and they were thought to represent the people and to protect the people's rights. That's a notable date in the transformation of thinking about government because it is the moment when the idea that people have rights against the monarch first begins to be understood and after 1430 acted upon because at that point, England institutes what comes to be known as the 40 shilling freehold. That meant if you had enough land, generally around 50 acres, to generate rent of 40 shillings, then you could vote for your member of parliament. But in England, that constituted probably less than 10% of the males in the kingdom. And during the course of the 17th century, that might have expanded to as much as 20% with wide variations from one part of the realm to another. So we're talking about a very, very small number of people in England who could vote in the 17th century. And so when the colonists descend into the new world in North America and set up towns and assemblies of their own, they really are taking steps that do not resemble in any direct way what was going on in England, because there is from the start no landed aristocracy that can constitute something like a house of lords. Instead, there are freeholders because there's more land available in the new world. And so people come up with new ways of constituting representative assemblies. But they're deviating from the beginning, from the standard practices in 17th century England. And it's important to recognize that difference. In your book, Toward Democracy, You spend a lot of time talking about New England and how democratic it was for any settlement in the 17th century and later the 18th century. What do you think made New England so democratic? 
And what did democracy in New England look like? So one of the reasons that I undertook the book toward democracy was my conviction that the Americans in the 17th and certainly in the 18th century thought of themselves as doing something that would resemble what we come to call democracy, that is to say, self-rule. And there are several reasons for that. One is that they use the term democracy in the founding documents of places like the colony of Newport in what became the colony of Rhode Island and in towns such as Dedham and Hartford. They themselves made use of the concept of popular sovereignty. Now, that didn't mean that they thought they were already breaking from the rule of the king or from God's rule. And while I think of them as being fledgling democracies because of the institutions they put in place, they certainly didn't think of themselves as instituting democracies. They thought of themselves as doing God's will. And the point of constituting themselves as gathered communities was to make it possible for them to live lives consistent with what they saw as God's will. They had in mind a kind of peaceful community, but within just a few years, conflicts broke out, as they always do, and it was necessary for them to begin to find the institutions that would make it possible to resolve those controversies. One among those was the idea of a town meeting. And that becomes so important in New England that Alexis de Tocqueville, the French aristocrat who comes to America in the 1830s, thought of that as the seedbed of democracy. And I think Tocqueville was right about that. I think there is something in the covenant theology that Puritans accepted that gave them confidence that they were living according to God's will if they joined together and made up the rules themselves for how they were going to govern themselves. After 1634 in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they began to elect representatives who would meet with the governor of the colony. At that point, they discovered that the charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony actually gave the freemen the right to choose the governor. And they were so unhappy that John Winthrop had not let them know that, that they chose a different governor, his deputy, Thomas Dudley. And that, in some ways, is the origin of the election of officials in the colonies in New England. In 1636, in Massachusetts, the general court gave to the freemen the authority to, in the words of the document, choose their own particular officers. And that was another very important step. Now, at first, only members of these town church communities could vote. Then anyone with that 40 shilling freehold could exercise the franchise. And because land was available in New England, as much as something between 60 and 80 percent of adult males could vote. And then that expanded in the 1650s to perhaps 60 to 90 percent. Later, it declined because there were fewer church members and then because there were more property qualifications. But still, this is a percentage of people who could vote completely different from the percentage in England. But we have to keep in mind that these were not elections of the sort that we think of today. There were no particular candidates that represented positions. Instead, the members of the town gathered in town meeting and they agreed on the person who would represent them in the general court. And in most New England towns, it was the same person or the same set of people who were chosen year after year after year. And these were generally the most notable, the most wealthy families in the town. There was a kind of hierarchy that was understood, as Winthrop put it in the famous sermon that he preached on the Arbella, that hierarchy was God's will, that it was no more a human creation than the weather. And so assuming that hierarchy was legitimate, it's not surprising that those who could vote again and again returned to office the same people. Those were assumed to be the people who were the best qualified to exercise authority in politics. In 1619, the settlement at Jamestown formed the first electing governing body in English North America. What did democracy in Virginia look like? Was it similar to the governments that would later form in New England? The Virginia Company had offered 50 acres in the New World to any voyagers who could fund their own trip. 
And they authorized also an assembly of representatives. So it's true. That assembly was the first self-governing body in the New World. The difference between Virginia and New England has to do more than anything else, I think, with the kind of people who came to Virginia. Those who came to New England, by and large, thought of themselves as members of a kind of religious pilgrimage, at least in the first generation of those who arrived. Whereas in Virginia, it was primarily people who were interested in making money and interested in improving their economic situation. They were not successful in doing that until they discovered the tobacco crop, which made a number of the early planters fabulously wealthy by 17th century standards. And slavery was instituted primarily because growing tobacco was extremely difficult work and slaves could be made to do it. So once slavery was instituted in Virginia, the gap between those rich planters and poor whites expanded, but it was dwarfed by the gap between every white person and African chattel slaves. Slavery really then was the distinction between New England and Virginia. It's not to say that New England was not involved in the slave trade or that there were people who owned slaves in New England, but it was never as central a feature of New England cultures as it became in Virginia. Since there was so much land available in the colony of Virginia, most whites, even those who came over as indentured servants, eventually could attain land and thus could vote. But again, hierarchy was more or less assumed. And so the idea that somehow because people could exercise the vote, they were displacing the wealthy with uh, ordinary people is a fantasy. That didn't happen. It was ruled by a kind of oligarchy, even though it wasn't the landed aristocracy that had ruled in England. So the difference between New England and Virginia is primarily the distance between the richest and the poorest citizens or subjects as they would have been in the 17th century. It seems that by the 18th century, the British colonies were more firmly established and elections became more common. As you've mentioned, British colonists participated in representative government through voting at significantly higher percentages than their British counterparts. The widespread availability of land in the colonies and in turn the ability to become a landowner accounts for this difference. Jim, could you explain to us why British Americans continued to use land ownership as a voting qualification in the 18th century? Two reasons. First, I think it was traditional in England. And since these were almost entirely, at least initially, English settlers, they opted to follow the patterns that had already been established in England, and the 40 shilling freehold was already two centuries old by the time the migration to the New World started. The logic behind it was that only people who had a stake in the place where they lived, that is to say people who owned land, should participate in governance. And The other part of that was that dependency was understood to mean that you could be bought or that you could be pressured. So if you were dependent on another person, if you were not an independent landowner, you were not understood to have the sufficient wherewithal or the civic virtue to vote for the good of the whole. The idea of a virtuous citizenry descends from the Renaissance into 17th century European political thought. And the assumption is that only independent, autonomous citizens can exercise the vote responsibly. And the best measure of whether or not you are independent is whether you own sufficient land to be able to generate rent if you wanted to do that. So it's a combination of traditional custom and the idea of Republican citizenship and who is capable of exercising civic virtue and seeing the good of the whole rather than merely a narrow self-interest. By the revolutionary era, how far had colonists deviated from the democracy they left behind in England? And how did this deviation in expectations and experiences of representation contribute to the revolution? Well, my own answer to that question would take us back to the English Civil War. In the 1640s, England fought a civil war every bit as brutal as the wars of religion on the continent a century before. And it seems to me as though it really has to be understood as a war of religion because the contending parties were Puritans, Presbyterians, and Anglicans. 
And even though there were all sorts of other political machinations involved, it really did come down to a struggle between those who believed in self-government and wanted to do away with monarchy, the people who were considered to be responsible then for the regicide, for the killing of Charles I, and royalists who believed in the divine right of kings and believed that England could not survive without the monarchy. And into the 18th century, that belief in the necessity of monarchy persisted in England, even though there were contending forces within Parliament by the time of the American Revolution. In the American colonies, by contrast, the king's representatives, the royal governors, had been more and more challenged by the colonial assemblies. Ever since it's called the Revolution of 1688, what I think of as a coup that replaced a Catholic monarch with a Protestant monarch, England essentially had been an oligarchy. And the crown in the 18th century assumed that it should continue to be able to exercise authority in the colonies as it had pretended to do in the 17th century. But during the course of the 18th century, the colonies became more and more self-assured, their assemblies became more and more contentious, and the king's representatives, both the governor and the council, which was usually appointed by the governor, found themselves on the defensive again and again. So the colonists over the course of the 18th century began to feel themselves more and more separate from England. And when the Crown tried to tighten the screws and to make the colonists pay some of the costs of empire. The colonists felt empowered to object and to contend that they were equal to parliament, that their assemblies should have the same authority to govern them that parliament had to govern people in England. And in fact, some of their more inflammatory proclamations denied that parliament had any authority over the colonies at all. So Partly it was the natural maturing of these institutions of self-government at the town level in New England and in the county and colonial level in the middle colonies and the southern colonies that gave the colonists confidence that the crown's authority was illegitimate, that it was corrupt, and that only their own popularly elected representatives should exercise authority over them. As the first English settlers crossed the Atlantic Ocean, they brought with them the concepts of British democracy. However, from the beginning, the forms of representative government that these early colonists established were very different from the examples they left behind. For example, New England colonists met in town meetings where church membership was as important as land ownership as a qualifier to vote, while in Virginia, social hierarchy resulted in more of an oligarchy, where wealthy whites held power despite poor white landowners being able to vote. By the 18th century, when the British North American colonies had become more established and elections more regular, it appears that the wide availability of land in British North America and the relative ease with which a person could become a landowner proved the significant deviation from Britain in determining just how many men could cast a vote. Now that we have a firm understanding of how colonists conceived of the representative governments they established and participated in, it's time we investigate the -the on-the-ground history of voting and election days. Who could vote and why? How did an eligible voter cast a vote? Did major elections always happen on the first Tuesday in November? Did political parties exist? Did candidates debate each other? Amy Watson is an assistant professor of history at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, who specializes in the history of British imperial partisanship and politics. She recently published an article in the William & Mary Quarterly that highlighted the Westchester election of 1733. I think she'll be the perfect person to answer these questions for us. But first, we'll take a moment to hear from Liz about our episode sponsor. It's fascinating to hear how democracy developed in colonial British America. And I'm really looking forward to Holly's conversation with Amy Watson so that we can find out more about who could vote in British America. But before we move into Holly's conversation with Amy Watson, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about an exciting program. As you know from our many conversations on this podcast, Historical research is a painstaking process. Historians like Jim Kloppenberg spend years searching out historical sources, interpreting those sources, and then taking what they found to make their case for why we should view the past a certain way. Likewise, each episode of Ben Franklin's World is also the result of a painstaking process. Each minute you hear on this podcast 
is a result of one hour of the digital audio team's labor. Now, the Omohundro Institute and I are committed to putting in this work because we want you to have access to well-researched history and information about the early American past. But this commitment takes resources, and we could really use your help. This is why I'm asking you to support our work by joining the Ben Franklin's World Subscription Program. Your subscription of $5.99 per month or $60 per year will help us continue to produce the high-quality episodes that you've come to love, episodes that skip hyperbole and provide solid historical research on complex issues. Plus, you'll also be supporting a podcast that finds its way into classrooms and study guides, lunchtime learning sessions, and extended dinnertime conversations. As a thank you for your support, you'll receive a monthly bonus episode on the last Friday of each month, and you'll never have to have your episodes interrupted again with ads like this one. So please become a subscriber. Join our subscription program, benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe, and help us continue to bring exciting new historical scholarship right to your ears. Join us at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. It's 2020, which means we're in an election year. When we read the 26th Amendment to the Constitution, we can see that anyone who is 18 years of age and a United States citizen can register to vote. Amy, what qualifications did a person in colonial British America need to meet to vote during the 17th and 18th centuries? Well, the qualifications for voting varied a lot from colony to colony, but in general, the franchise was restricted to white adult male colonists who owned a certain amount of property, usually about 50 to 100 acres of land. And there were often age requirements then, just like there are today. 21 years of age was the most frequent cutoff, so not 18. There were usually exceptions for colonists who lived in cities and therefore did not own a lot of land. So for instance, in Albany and in New York City, white men could qualify to vote by paying a modest fee to register as a free man. And in practice, these rules were also sometimes not applied very consistently. So, for example, historians Robert and B. Catherine Brown collected some election statistics for Richmond County, Virginia, and they noted that in the election of 1735, more than half of the voters did not actually meet the technical property requirements. But even if election inspectors were sometimes lenient with white male colonists, that does not mean that this was an open system where anybody could vote. There were two major groups of Americans who were almost entirely excluded from voting, women and people of color. Now, women were not necessarily legally prohibited from voting by statute. Most election laws from this period are actually completely silent on the issue of gender. However, in practice, women were denied the franchise. And this was partly due to the property requirements for voting. Married women under the legal doctrine of coveture could not usually own their own property. There may have been one or two instances of wealthy widows who voted. So for instance, there's a somewhat questionable record of a widowed woman named Lydia Taft voting in Uxbridge, Massachusetts in the 1750s. But these possible exceptions are pretty few and far between. In practice, women generally were not allowed to vote. With people of color, it was much the same as with women. Electoral laws did not usually mention race explicitly in the 17th and 18th centuries, although in some colonies it did. It's really hard to find examples of Black or Indigenous people voting in colonial elections. It is worth mentioning, however, that in certain colonial cities, especially those in the Northeast, there was a long-standing custom of Black Americans holding their own elections within their local community. In Newport, Rhode Island, for example, African Americans in the colonial period had an annual celebration, usually in June, in which they would gather next to a large tree in Newport and elect a Black governor who had significant responsibilities within the local Black community. After this election, Black Americans oftentimes paraded through the streets of Newport. And these Black elections could also influence white political traditions. For instance, the tree where Newport Black Americans held these elections 
eventually became Newport's Liberty Tree during the Stamp Act crisis and the Revolutionary Era. So African Americans carved out a political space for themselves, even while being excluded from the British American franchise. Okay, to vote in colonial British America, one had to be white, male, over the age of 21, and most importantly, be a landowner. Amy, take us to an election day. What were elections in colonial British America like? Well, to me, the most important thing to know about elections in colonial British America is that they were a lot of fun. They were community-wide events that involved spectacle and pageantry and popular engagement. So unlike modern-day elections that oftentimes play out in a pretty private sphere, elections in colonial America were highly public events. It's sometimes a bit hard to talk about a typical election because every colony did things just a little bit differently during this era. But there were certainly some common elements that were true for most elections. Unlike today, elections did not take place on a prescribed date every year. In some colonies, such as New York, until 1743, legislative elections only technically had to be called upon the death of a British king. So an assembly could theoretically go years or even decades without an election. In practice, though, elections usually happened a lot more frequently than that. And in some colonies, like Pennsylvania, for example, elections occurred every single year. Now, there were often elections that were held for a whole range of different kinds of positions. For instance, there were elections for sheriff and county coroner and city aldermen or select men. In Massachusetts, they even held elections for the colonial governor for a time period, although that stopped being the case around the 1680s or so. And the nature of campaigning during the colonial period was a bit different than we're used to today. Usually, candidates themselves did not campaign. That looked bad. It was perceived as ungentlemanly or overly self-serving. And there were not organized political debates or anything of that nature. Instead, candidates would often recruit a few political lieutenants to campaign upon their behalf. And these lieutenants, or friends as they were sometimes called, would write letters and they would hold meetings and events to try to convince as many people as possible to support their candidate. And while most of these lieutenants were men, there are some examples of women who were becoming pretty involved in campaigns in the 18th century in particular. So for instance, in the Pennsylvania election of 1742, there was a prominent woman named Susanna Wright who played a really pivotal role in campaigning for the Quaker Party that year. She wrote a public letter that criticized the opposing proprietary party, and then she distributed that letter in churches and political meetings across the colony. Colonial era campaigns also sometimes made use of the press as well. For example, in New York, members of the Patriot Party there had a weekly newspaper called the New York Weekly Journal that proved to be a really effective tool at election time. At moments such as the New York magistrate elections in 1734, the paper would publish articles telling readers exactly who to vote for and why. It was a lot like the newspaper endorsements that we're more familiar with today. Amy, as you mentioned, election days were fun. One of the traditions I've read about and that struck me as particularly interesting was the practice of treating, in which huge amounts of alcohol were passed out to potential voters in an effort to solicit votes. Could you tell us about the practice of treating? Was it widespread? Was it legal? Treating was definitely one of the most important parts of Election Day. And this was when a candidate offered people abundant food and alcohol. It was a big neighborhood block party. It was a big celebration. So for an example, in an election in 1758, Washington offered his constituents 28 gallons of rum, 50 gallons of rum punch, 34 gallons of wine, 46 gallons of beer, and two gallons of cider. So as you might imagine, by the end of these treats, you would likely have some voters who were good and tipsy. While it depended on the locality, election treats were often open to women and white working class men who did not meet the property requirements to vote. However, many women and enslaved people and people of color would have likely been more involved in the labor of actually cooking and organizing the treat. 
rather than in actually enjoying it themselves. Now, the legality of these treats was somewhat questionable. There were occasionally accusations of candidates using these treats to bribe people into changing their votes. But candidates usually got around this by just offering the treats to voters and non-voters alike. That way, candidates could claim that they were just being hospitable to the community as a whole. So whether it's technically legal or not, treats were widely accepted as a normal part of election days. In terms of expectations that voters had about treating, In some districts, voters certainly expected candidates to provide them with a certain amount of food and alcohol. In fact, some voters may have punished candidates who did not treat them. For example, in Virginia, a wealthy politician named Landon Carter lost an election in 1742, and he blamed this loss on his failure to treat voters in the style to which they had become accustomed. He actually ended up lodging a complaint with the Committee of Privileges and Elections in an attempt to get this election overturned. And in this complaint, Carter argued that his opponent had cheated by providing such a lavish amount of alcohol and intoxicating voters into supporting his candidacy. However, the Virginia House of Burgesses did not take Landon Carter's claim very seriously. They gave the seat to his opponent. How unique were colonial British American Election Day practices? Were they simply carrying over traditions from England, or were there major differences? Well, the major difference between elections in Britain and America was just the number of people who were eligible to vote. In Britain, land was pretty scarce. So the minimum property requirement, which was usually property valued at 40 shillings a year, was a pretty high bar to meet. In fact, in 1715, only a quarter of the English adult male population actually owned enough land to vote. While the property requirements were pretty similar in most of the American colonies, a lot of Americans owned land, so a greater percentage of the population could meet this bar. In Massachusetts, for example, about 75% of adult males had enough property to be able to vote throughout most of the 18th century. Still, there were parts of Britain that could be relatively inclusive about voting. In parts of London, for example, working class artisans and tradesmen could vote. And therefore, the franchise ended up including about the same proportion of the population as in colonial America. And this has led historians like Penelope Corfield to call 18th century London a proto-democratic system. So it's not quite as simple as just America having more eligibility to vote. One other difference between British and American voting was that colonial American electoral districts tended to be a little bit fairer in terms of how representation was apportioned. In 18th century Britain, there were a few relatively new cities like Leeds and Birmingham and Manchester that did not have a single parliamentary representative. And that's just because the cities had not existed at the time that representatives were allocated. And Parliament just hadn't gotten around to fixing it yet. There were also some very old rural districts in places like Cornwall that had several representatives, even though there were more sheep than people who were living in that district. Those kinds of issues did not exist to the same degree in colonial British America. The districts tended to be a bit fairer. But I would say for the most part, Colonists borrowed most of their election traditions almost directly from Britain. For instance, election treating and parades and banquets were all common British political traditions that stretch back centuries. All right, let's get into some examples. Amy, in the article you wrote for the William & Mary Quarterly, you recounted an election day in Westchester, New York in October 1733. Would you tell us about this election day and whether it was typical of election days in the colonies? The Westchester election of 1733 was a really exciting election because it took place at this moment of high drama in New York politics, when the colony was extremely politically divided between two different political parties. The election pitted schoolmaster William Forster against the former New York Chief Justice, Lewis Morris. Supporters of Lewis Morris started congregating at midnight because they were worried that the other side would try to pull a fast one on them and count votes before they arrived. The next morning, 
the two groups began to parade around the town green. Forster's parade included 170 men on horseback who shouted, no land tax. On the other side, however, Morris was accompanied by two trumpeters, three violinists, 300 men on horseback, and a large crowd of freeholders who shouted, no excise. After some name-calling between the two groups, the votes were finally tallied, and Morris was declared the winner. Morris's victory was then celebrated with a gun salute and a wide city banquet. Now, the Westchester election of 1733 was a bit unusual in terms of just how over the top it was. But this kind of pageantry was by no means unprecedented. The elaborate displays, the banners, the banquets, the horse parades, were all just part of the fun of an election day. One thing that is a little bit different about the Westchester election is that it had some interesting similarities with another election that was going on about the same time, the British parliamentary elections across the Atlantic Ocean. In England, the most controversial political event of 1733 was an excise tax that the Whig ministry tried to pass on wine and tobacco. And because of this tax, the Patriot Party in England began using no excise as an electoral slogan. To counter this slogan, the Whigs would shout no land tax. So that's probably why New Yorkers were shouting about taxes in the Westchester election of 1733. They adopted these British electoral slogans in their own campaign. And as I argue in my article, these colonists saw their own election battle as part of a broader election battle between Whigs and Patriots that was taking place across the British Atlantic world as a whole. It seems like Election Day could get pretty rowdy. Were there any instances of violence or rioting? Just like today, people could get pretty heated about politics in the colonial period. So when you combine that with the crowds of people who would show up, and as you mentioned, the abundant rum and beer and wine, things could take a violent turn. So for example, there was an election in Philadelphia in 1742, in which two different parties, the Quaker Party and the Proprietary Party, were vying for a majority in the assembly. In the campaign leading up to the election of 1742, the Proprietary Party had done a very good job about recruiting Philadelphia's sailors and dock workers to their side. The Proprietary Party supported the ongoing War of Jenkins' Ear that Britain was engaged in in the 1740s, while the Quaker Party, because of their religious convictions against war, did not support this conflict. Philadelphia's sailors were extremely pro-war, so they were natural allies for the proprietary group. However, most of these sailors did not actually own enough property to vote for their preferred party. So to express their displeasure against the Quakers, about 80 of these sailors marched up to the courthouse where the polling was taking place and began just physically assaulting Quakers and their supporters. They started beating people with clubs. They were heaving stones through windows. It was pretty brutal. But this riot really backfired on the sailors and the proprietary party that they supported. When the melee had calmed down, Philadelphians were still able to cast their votes. And many voters were so appalled by the violence that they actually changed their votes to vote for the Quaker Party. We actually have examples of physical ballots in which people crossed out their original choice and put in a member of the Quaker Party instead. In this case, at least, violence did not pay off in terms of electoral returns. The Quaker Party won in a landslide. And while the election of 1742 in Philadelphia was a bit extreme, this kind of violence was not at all unprecedented. In fact, it wasn't even unique to America. In Britain, for example, there was election in Westminster in 1741 in which soldiers began physically assaulting members of the crowd who had lined up to vote for the Patriot and Tory coalition, resulting in what one eyewitness described as broken heads and bloody noses. Because the Whig party ran the British government at the time, there was a lot of speculation that Whig Prime Minister Robert Walpole 
had actually ordered these soldiers to cause havoc and secure a victory for the Whigs. As with the Philadelphia election, however, this violence backfired. When reports reached Parliament of this blatant voter intimidation, the House of Commons declared the election void and scheduled a do-over for a later date. During this second Westminster election, the Patriot and Tory coalition won by an overwhelming majority. So as you can see, violence was present at a lot of these elections during this period. And because of how common this violence could be, it actually became a normal policy for British and British American politicians to hire the equivalent of bouncers or security guards to protect them and their supporters on election day. Violence was just part of the fabric of 18th century elections. What lessons did colonial elections offer the framers of the Constitution? And what did these lessons mean for elections in the early republic? That's a good question. I think there's this notion sometimes amongst historians that divisive partisan campaigns were an invention of the early American republic associated with the rise of the Federalist and Republican parties. But if you look back to colonial British America, you can see examples of elections that were just as heated and issue-driven as those in a later period. So really, I think that elections in colonial British America just signaled that American politics were going to be divisive in the future. As much as framers like James Madison might have hoped that if they were really, really careful, they could create a system of government that would do away with organized political division. In practice, that ship had already sailed. Now, in terms of the colonial period's constitutional legacy, elections in colonial British America differed a lot from colony to colony. And that political tradition of each locality managing their own elections was pretty much baked into the Constitution. Article 1, Section 4, for instance, says that the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state, although it also gave Congress the power to alter those regulations if it sees fit. So if you've ever wondered why Americans vote with paper ballots in Connecticut, but with a computer screen in Delaware, and why each state has very different regulations about absentee ballots, for instance. America's colonial history is probably responsible for this variety, for better or worse. However, there were a few issues that the framers were trying to fix with colonial elections. So, for example, in the colonial period, elections were not always held very regularly. In some colonies, for instance, assembly elections were only held about once every seven years or so, which can be a pretty long time to wait if you're a voter who's unhappy with an assembly's political actions. So the framers made sure to specify in the Constitution how frequently federal elections needed to occur, every two years for the House of Representatives and every six years for a Senate seat. To take one more example, in many colonies, a candidate for office did not actually have to reside in the county that he represented, and he could run in multiple places at once. This was true in Britain, too. There was an election in 1741 in which a popular candidate named Edward Vernon actually ran in six different districts, and he won the election in three of them. So the framers in Article 1 explicitly made it a requirement. The candidates for the U.S. Congress had to at least be inhabitants of the state that they represented. Though strangely enough, they did not actually go so far as requiring that candidates lived in the district they represented. Overall, though, the Constitution does not say a whole lot about how elections were actually supposed to be run. The framers left that power to the states and ultimately for Congress to determine. Early American elections were fun, booze-filled, community-wide events. There are also heated partisan showdowns, just as contentious and party-divided as the elections we have today. As Amy revealed, when drafting the Constitution, the framers did apply some of the lessons they learned from participating in colonial elections. For example, elections in the early republic were held regularly, every two years for Congress, and candidates had to live in the state that they were planning to represent. Still, the founders left room for variation. 
and allowed each state to determine who could vote and how votes would be cast by the electorate. This variation in how votes are cast persists today. What other changes to early American election practices did the founders enact, and what practices did they keep? By exploring the origins of early American democracy, we gain a better understanding of just how radical some of the founders' ideas about early Republican representative government were. We also gain a better understanding of the arguments made by many early Republican women and people of color that the changes that the founders enacted to expand the franchise were not actually as radical as they may have seemed. Thank you, Holly. Great interviews. Now, if you'd like notes on the information Holly and her guests discussed, or more information about Holly's guests, Jim Kloppenberg and Amy Watson, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 284. Incidentally, the show notes page is also where you'll find links to the OI Reader. That's where you'll access the bibliography and all the resources we've gathered to complement this series. If you've enjoyed this episode and the start of our series on elections, please consider supporting this work by joining the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. You can join at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, as this is a four-episode series, we'll be posting episodes weekly this month. So stay tuned next week for our second episode about the origins and development of federal elections and who could participate in those elections. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.